All right, I think we're ready to start. Well, uh, first of all, thanks again for coming all, all of you for lecture number two of uh, Pragmatic Haskell for Beginners. Uh, this, is, um, this is, once again, just to remind you guys, this makes the most sense if uh, you've already looked at books like Learn Your Haskell. You have a cursory fundamental understanding of the language and you are wondering, how do I get useful things done with it? This is the lecture for you. Now, to recap where we were last time uh, with lecture number one, first of all, there's the GitHub project, which you can check out. I don't have the link here, but you can uh, see it in, on, um, I'll post it on the Meetup page. To, for your reference, uh, last time we started a very basic uh, Cabal project with Stack. Uh, we figured out what goes where, what makes sense, uh, what, what those different attributes do. We did a bit of test-first development with uh, Cabal and this, this stack flow. And we actually implemented a parser with Megaparsec to parse a custom text file into a Haskell data type. And additionally, we covered a bunch of areas and made a, made a skill set such as how do I get useful packages out of package? Because apparently, and turns out it's actually not that trivial of a skill. So today, we are all about databases. Last time we extracted that text from the text file and uh, according to our scenario, we want to store that text in a structured format in a database. So the question is, how do we do that? Where, would, where do we start? And in future talks, we will cover additional features, HTTP API calls, uh, serving some of that content from our database uh, over, um, over the web, and then productizing and making things more idiomatic. So if you are to solve, if you are to pick a library to interact with the database, what do you use? We're once again back to that discussion that we had last time in terms of how do I pick a library? It is a non-trivial issue. So let's, let's do that together. Let's go back to that site that I showed you last time, which is this um, HaskellIsEasy.com site. And uh, let's use it for reference. It's actually a pretty reasonable resource. It's so far, so good. What does it tell you? So it tells you to try either PostgreSQL simple. Let's assume you're working against Postgres or its various different incarnations, simple incarnations of that library. Or it tells you to use persistent with Escalado if you're trying to be more type safe. So let's start with uh, PostgreSQL simple. Actually, I think I, yeah. So this library fundamentally is a fairly raw SQL a wrapper around, in the case of Postgres, PostgreSQL libpq, which is the C bindings, to the, the bindings to the uh, C interface for libpq. I wouldn't use this package in general for almost anything because it is, it is kind of a building block for libraries on top of it, but it, wasn't, it wouldn't be something I would use in my own application because it mostly works on strings and works on, it does have some parameterization, but we're working in Haskell, we can do a lot better. We're working in Haskell for a reason. And we can do better by using something like persistent. So persistent today is going to be my choice for you guys and I will explain to you very quickly why that's the case. So first of all, let's go over that skill set that we talked about last time. How do we identify if this is a good package? Well, a lot of versions. That's, this package has been definitely maintained. The very first version is from year 2010. That's, that's a lot of years that were put into this, um, into this project. So it's, it's developed by Michael Snowman and Greg Weber. So they're very well known authors in the community. That's another thumbs up. And even more importantly, just like we discussed last time, this has documentation. It has really good documentation with examples. If you aren't familiar with the Yasod framework and with the Yasod ecosystem, this is an ecosystem that was put together by uh, Michael Snoyman and um, Greg helped him out over time that solves most of the common problems that you encounter in web development in Haskell. And it does that with a very cohesive vision of how, how to accomplish that. It is not super opinionated, but is very featureful. Uh, 
And what's really nice about it is that it's so well designed that you can kind of use pieces of it here and there if you want. You don't have to buy into the whole thing. For example, you don't have to use Yasode to use Persistent. You can use Persistent in isolation. You don't need to know anything about Yasode to use it. And just like I mentioned last time, we have code snippets, copy pasta, all day long. And uh, actually, I ended up doing that exactly for my project. Now, what is, uh, what is special about Persistent? Why do we like Persistent so much? Well, first of all, it supports multiple databases. You like MySQL, has MySQL. You like Redis, sure, we have a plugin for that. Uh, do you like Postgres like we do? We have that. Uh, SQLite, awesome. Also, it allows you to define all of your entities in one single place. And we actually will cover this in just a second. So there's very little code repetition. And it solves that boundary issue that is so problematic in general when working with the impurities of the outside world, the non-Haskell impurities, which is we are accepting data from an outside source, and we want to make sure that it fits into our beautiful realm of purity and types in Haskell. And, and we do that either through JSON for something like an HTTP API, or we do that through these protocols when talking to a database. And Persistence solves that for you. Also, again, very well documented. It's, it's honestly just a pleasure to use. So let me make sure I didn't miss any important highlights here. But yeah, it also does migrations for you. It's not super sophisticated in terms of uh, advanced migrations. I wouldn't use it in a long-lived production project, but if you're just starting out, you're throwing some code together, it's, uh, it's quite nice. And the other major advantage of it is that the reason why we're using Haskell is because we want to catch things in compile time. We don't want to either write unit tests for everything, just to make sure that our, our um, code makes sense against the schema, and just to make sure that those type coercions work. And um, when we do change things, we want to discover right away that there is something broke. And we want the compiler to tell us about that. And in other languages, you really don't get that. But with, with Persistent, that's something that's pretty much its reason to exist, is to blow up when things will not work. So let's go to our trusty VM. I'm assuming you guys are seeing this. This is a really tiny screen. And uh, let's let me, let me try this one more time. Let me just resize it real quick. OK. So just as a reminder of what we covered last time, this is the specs file that we parsed. Can you guys see that at all? Is that bigger? Ah. Let, let's do that. 14 is not good enough. Let's do 18. Is that better? Much better, or is that sufficiently better? OK. Well, if you guys need it larger, you let me know. So the way this works is we have a username, and we have a series of paragraphs associated with this username. We wrote a mega parsec implementation of parsing this thing. Now, how do we store it in the database? So we start, first of all, with defining our entities, or essentially the tables that we will use to uh, store this data. And um, this is, and actually, let me pop open the cabal file to go hand in hand with this. So what do we need to do to enable this special format? This is an EDSL, as you can see. This isn't regular Haskell code. What are we even looking at? So first of all, I had to add the persistent library. I had to add the persistent SQLite library because we are going to be talking. Actually, you guys probably can't see that. Let me. I had to add the persistent SQLite library here because we're going to be talking to a SQLite database. And I had to add the persistent template library, which is uh, the library that allows us to write template Haskell to define our tables in persistent. So let's go to our entities. This special syntax that you're seeing here, this is the infamous template Haskell. So if you've been around the, the Haskell community long enough, it's a contentious point. Some people love it. Some people hate it. It's like macros and Lisp. Are they good for you? Are they bad for you? Well, history, history will tell. But the way this works is that this uh, template Haskell 
by default, uh, what it does is it takes a bunch of special syntax, it transforms it, parses it, transforms it into the underlying Haskell ASD, and then allows you to massage it however way you want, and then spits it back out into the file. It splices it, as we, in technical terms, and then GHC actually compiles it uh, after that. It's just like a Lisp macro. It's a very powerful tool. And the extension that we're using on top of that is quasi-quotation. And quasi-quotation, what that allows you to do, it allows you to specify custom parsers for template Haskell. Because by default, it starts with about four or five of them. And they're mostly to generate Haskell expressions. Um, they mostly to parse a very specific syntax. It, it's not flexible enough to parse arbitrary syntax like this guy. So that's where if uh, I bring back up the Cabal file, you will see that I had to enable template Haskell, quasi quotes, and all of this mumbo jumbo that you're seeing here in addition to it, it's, these are uh, GHC extensions that are necessary for persistent to work. Because behind the scenes when, when template Haskell generates persistent code, it, is, it uses a lot of these advanced features of GHC. So we want to enable them even though we ourselves aren't going to see them actively used because that's generated for us. You want to have them, you want to have this in your Cabal file. What this syntax does is first of all, this is a declaration of a section that will de define tables. Uh, this just means use default uh, relational database tables because we are talking to uh, our RDBMS here. We're not talking to Mongo or Redis. Create a migrate all function. This, what this will do is if you run this function in, in IO or well, if you run this function within the persistent monad, this will perform the migration for you of this entire table. And uh, then go ahead and parse this syntax and turn it into persistent, uh, persistent structures. Now I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. First of all, migrations. What can persistent migrations do for you? They're, they're quite nice as in what persistent does is it scans the schema and it sees what is in the schema. Uh, are, do these tables exist? Cool, these tables exist, I don't have to create them, otherwise I will create them for you. And then it checks what columns are out there. Do I have these columns? Okay, columns missing, columns need to be deleted, I'll do that for you. Assuming it's safe, it will actually explode if you're doing something unsafe unless you use an unsafe migration version because it doesn't want you to lose data, that would be uh, somewhat unpleasant. And it can do most transformations, most uh, DDL for you, uh, as long as it's a safe transformation. So it's quite nice. Then the rest of the syntax, this defines a Haskell data type, in this case a user. This is that same user from the specs.foo file that we talked about later, uh, earlier. There's a, this, this points to a specific table. It says this table in the database will be call, uh, called users. And it creates one column for this table called name, which is of type string. We talked about string last time. Try to use text, generally speaking, but for simplicity's sake, we'll just use string here. Also, this includes a unique constraint. Anything in uh, persistent uh, template Haskell syntax that starts with a capital uh, with an uppercase letter is a uniqueness constraint. And the uniqueness constraint will be on the name column. And then a bunch of just automated derivation for you for this user Haskell data, data type. This is the same exact thing as, as above, it's just a different table. But the cool thing here is that we're already creating a foreign key constraint here. So as you can see, this says, in addition to the content column, I want a user ID column uh, of type user ID. But as you notice, where is user ID coming from? I didn't actually define it anywhere. Again, template Haskell uh, metaprogramming, that was generated for you by Persistent when it parsed this, um, when it basically rendered this macro into Haskell code. Every, unless you specifically disable it, which I think you can do, you will get a additional primary key surrogate uh, sequential integer uh, column for each one of your tables called, for example, user ID. Or here, it'll be called uh, paragraph ID. You don't see it, but this is created for you behind the scenes unless you disable that. And so now you can do things like, I want to reference this column here. And uh, I will show you guys uh, the migration in just a second, and you will see that reference, 
uh, constraint actually being enforced. And uh, if you're actually curious what this code looks like once it gets templated, then you can absolutely look at it. And the way you do that is let's, so first of all, you clean it, because if it's already built, it won't build it again. Uh, and you run stack build, or cabal build if you want, with these specific DHC options. You use dump splices, which is essentially says the splice is the thing that gets injected into the code. Just dump it somewhere in a file and for me to look at later. And suppress all, it's, uh, it's a nice visual helper because by default, splices will be dumped with a fully qualified name. That's generally the package name, package version, and literally all the path through the module to uh, all the way to the type. And it's really hard to read, especially for a giant template like, giant splice like persistence. So if you suppress it all, you just get the final uh, type name. This will build. Ta-da, and now let's actually look at it. It is located, it's usually located under stack work. That's a default location that stack picks for you. And it's the file with the same name, and it just ends with uh, dot dump splices. So if we check it out, you'll see that this is the original syntax. This is the thing, the expression that was spliced. And this monstrosity below it is the thing that was actually generated. And you can keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. This just goes on pretty much forever. Because that's, that's where the power of persistent comes in and of this uh, templating approach, is that it generates a lot of useful functionality for you here that, especially if you're starting out, you don't necessarily need to or want to understand. But for example, what it will do is it will say, cool, there's an ID column, and uh, its, its type in Haskell is going to be user ID. Its SQL representation is going to be a SQL in 64, and et cetera, et cetera. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend that if you're learning template Haskell, this is the best place to start because this will, uh, this will melt your brain. I don't think we've ever had to look at this either. So you will get pretty far without having to really dig into this. But it's there if you want to look at it. So let's go to our main. Unlike, so unlike last time, I don't want to be typing in front of you guys because it just takes up a lot of time. So I have this whole thing prepared. And uh, this isn't going to be test driven just for simplicity. Uh, actually testing things with persistent is somewhat quirky because of the nature of HSpec. Uh, I think at some point we will release an update to this project with uh, a good sample of how to test things with persistent and HSpec. But it is, as far as I remember, it is non-trivial to get right. Like the ergonomics of it are not super pleasant. Uh, so, so I think we'll try to share that uh, with you guys. If you're using Yisode, you actually get that for free. Yisode gives you an HSpec uh, monad to test things in that's already pre-built for you where that has all the niceties. So if you want to cut corners and just get to it, uh, use Yisode. Now, last time we had the specs.foo file. We read it into memory. We parse it. This is that run parser run parser executor of parsing that I, I described last time. Parse sections is the top level parser. Specs.foo, just a, it's a debug helper. It it's, doesn't actually load that file. It just tells you uh, where in that file things blow up if there's an error. And the actual file contents that we read in. Just like I mentioned last time, on the left side, you get an error, means something didn't, didn't go well. On the right side, you actually get the output. I annotated it with the type. You don't really have to do that. It knows what it should result into. But I just put it here for our own reference. It is a list of sections. For your reminder, let me actually go there. A section is essentially this. It's a, it's a type with uh, two parameters. There's uh, two um, components. It's section username and section paragraphs, string and string. We can do better, and we'll do uh, better down the line. Um, in general, just having everything be a, be a string without being able to identify it is not the best idea in the universe. All right. Now, what we'll want to do is if you want to do any kind of operation against a database, you need to be in the context of a monad that is I.O. at the somewhere, I.O. at some point. So for example, to run, uh, run SQLite, you want to be in the context of a monad that is monad I.O which means that at the very bottom of whatever stack you're working on, there is an I.O. And the reason why it needs that is because 
Well, it needs to open a socket to talk to do a TCP request against a database, or it needs to open a file. It needs to do something with the outside world, so it has to have, have I/O somewhere. Even for in-memory databases, it still needs to be I/O, which is interesting. But I suppose that's because it's uh, it's probably because it's an atom, and so it needs to modify it in um, in place. Now, what the first step that we do here, uh, just for your reference, what this does, this says run a start a connection against a SQLite database here called uh, rdb.sqlite and uh, take essentially a giant set of instructions which are these instructions and execute them. Uh, this, this code itself here when you just write it out in the, in the source it actually isn't run until run SQLite ex is executed so this is essentially you preparing these instructions that will later be evaluated should run SQLite actually run. This is Know, as lazy as it can get because of Haskell's nature. First call is run migration. This is the thing that will populate the database with the right schema. And uh, I will actually execute it here really quickly. Now this might, so if you look here, this is the migration debug log. First of all, it says, I'm creating a table users with an ID, integer primary key, just like we discussed earlier. It has a constraint unique constraint on the name column. And then I'll create a second table, very similar. And uh, as you can see here at the very end, it has a null, uh, not null reference to the user's table on the user, uh, user ID column. So it is creating that foreign key constraint that we talked about earlier. And the next step is just it's querying users and it's dumping all the users. If you're not familiar with this print, this format of show, this is essentially what a persistent entity looks like. It's an entity on the outside, that's, the, uh, that's a top level type. And then an entity contains a, a fundamental identifier for this entity, which is usually for all these persistent tables, it's the primary key. And the entity value, which is the Haskell data type with, uh, uh, that you defined in that template Haskell code. In this case, it's type user with the value username equals Alex and username equals Chris, et cetera, et cetera. In, um, in the persistent world, an entity is something that was extracted from a database. If it's not an entity, it means it's something that is being prepared to be inserted in a database, and then it will acquire an ID after it's been inserted. Uh, theor theoretically, you can strip out the key portion when you get something from a database. There's nothing preventing you from doing that. But uh, in our experience, we just usually keep everything wrapped in entities when we're working with it. Now, what I did here is, this is a little bit tricky to look at, but it's actually not that, com not that bad. I'm just inserting, I'm going through this list of sections and I'm inserting a user for each one of those sections and I'm inserting all of the associated paragraphs with each of those users. So here I'm saying for each section, uh, forum is just something that allows you to do side effects without really returning anything uh, out of it. If you strip out the underscore, it will allow you to return something back here and save it and bind it. So I create this user. As I said, the, the actual type that, uh, this, is, this comes from the template Haskell. This type is unsaved. This is not an entity yet. And then I insert it with the uh, insert and I get the key back. So if I wanted to create the entity out of it, I could just uh, say entity, user ID, user, and I would get the entity of that type. And then for each one of those users, I insert all the paragraphs for them. And it's just insert the paragraph content and insert, insert the key that I just got up there from the user. Uh, I could, uh, so Persistent has a lot of niceties, has a lot of friendly helpers. For example, if you want to leverage inserting multiple values at the same time, you can totally do that. It's pretty featureful like that. And here I'm doing a select. So when you're operating with a database, interacting with a database, you either, you want to insert things, you want to update things, delete things, and you want to retrieve them eventually. So what is select list? As you can see, this is actually not saying what type it's operating against at all at any point. So you might wonder, how does it know to query the user table? That's, how does it do that? Well, it actually, select list is part of the persist store type class, which is instantiated for you by the template Haskell. And I just need to give the compiler a hint in terms of what am I trying to get back from this. And the way I do that, is by, is this is one way to do, it, to do it. You can do it in any way you want, but 
basically, if you ever mark that variable as of a specific type, in this case of type entity user, GHC will infer all the way back and say, oh, cool, this is, against, this is an operation against the user uh, table. Just to quickly cover the select list API, the first set of constraints, this is the where clause. So you can say, I'll actually cover it right here. This is, this is another way of specifying what table we're going against. I'm just saying this is going to be a list of filters against uh, the paragraph type. And uh, as I was saying earlier, the first list is a set of where clauses. And in this case, I'm just saying username is going to be Alex. And then the second, and I can have as many of these as I want. And the second list is essentially additional parameters that you can pass to any relational or any SQL where clause, such as limit, sorting, or ordering, et cetera, et cetera. And let me show you what that results in. Uh, I'm deleting the database every single time because I don't want to deal with upserting and all that good stuff. But upsert is actually supported if, you, if that's your thing. So here we have our users, paragraphs. Actually, uh, did I? Okay. Oh, perfect. I actually wanted to comment out most of this stuff. Cool. Now let's uncomment this stuff. As you'll see, now it fetches. So it will fetch all the users. It will fetch all the paragraphs, this giant blob here. Surprisingly or unsurprisingly, you become really good at reading this giant wall of text given enough time. So just, just bear with it, and you will be a pro. You will be a human parser. And at the very bottom, you can see that this is me fetching a user with username Alex, which was that constraint that we talked about here. Now. See, I actually probably don't need this. Now, this is a sam sample update, sample delete, if you're wondering what that looks like. All you have to say is, I want to update something, the, the row that has its primary key one. And here, it doesn't actually wonder what table to go against, because I'm saying very specifically, you will use paragraph ID. So you will, you will use the primary key of the paragraph table. So it's not confused. It can infer that pretty well. And same thing here, I'm saying you will set the content column of paragraph table to this specific value. This is all type checked. So for example, if I, if I change this to a number, if I change paragraph content to a number in my entity de definition, this would not even compile. This would say why are you are trying to save an integer into, a, into something that is a string. Because it, it won't do coercion for you. It's not, it's not what it's there for. And uh, this is an example of deletion. So, Pretty neat. Now, can anyone guess what the limitation of that select is just by looking at it? Question for the audience. Joe, you can't answer that. You know too much. Joe has seen things. OK, I will answer that for you. The select list can only address one table at a time, which is a bit of a bummer. If you, if you think about it, that's somewhat li limiting if you want to really use the power of SQL and do a bunch of joins. I won't, there might be hacks around that, but the way you would do that without leveraging any other additional library would be to write raw SQL. This is, by the way, this is a horrendous way of doing multi-line strings in Haskell. The way you would actually do nicer multi-line strings in Haskell is to use a quasi-quoter, except the quasi-quoter would, instead of generating persistent uh, code, it would generate a multi-line string. But here, I'm just keeping it as simple as possible by using native Haskell features. And so this is raw SQL. Now the problem with this is this will work. And you can parameterize as you can see, as you can see here. So persistent does give you this escape hatch of writing raw SQL. But we can do a lot better because this is all, this is all text now. If I change the name of this table, well, I will blow up either during tests if I bothered writing those tests or in production. Or if I change any of the stuff, if I change the name of this column, if I change the type of this column, it will, not it will not tell me anything useful about this. It will just say, sure, let me go, go run that for you. And uh, personal anecdote, all of the SQL errors and SQL issues, or at least I would say 95% of them that we see at Front Row, 
always because we were sloppy and lazy and we put together a bunch of raw SQL because someone didn't want to spend you know, 15 minutes writing a, an Escalator query with uh, the Escalator DSL, which we'll cover in a second. And then nothing caught that and it blew up in production. So if, if there's a word of wisdom I can pass to you guys is try not to ever use raw SQL if possible. There's some things that are very hard to represent outside of raw SQL, so I don't blame you, but try to avoid it if possible. There are also some ways of making this a little bit better is because you can extract metadata from persistent entities. So you can say, hey, persistent, what is the actual SQL name for this column or this field? And you can inject it into this text. So at least you will have some re reconnection to the entity. But you should use that as just plan Z if possible. And uh, let's try to execute this. This worked. This gave me a bunch of paragraphs. I, I queried them through a raw query. It worked just fine. However, we can do a lot better. And uh, the way we do better is we use this library called Escalado. Actually, it is pronounced completely differently. I think it's, it's, it's Portuguese, but uh, we, we actually, Felipe used to, the guy who made it, used to work here for a while, and he's on a sabbatical now. Uh, but he, he has a very charming way of pronouncing it, which I will never be able to replicate. But it's, it's something like Esculeto, so, something really cool. Uh, so if you know Portuguese, you could, you could correct me. But the way this works, what this does, is this is an EDSL just like the persistent entity definition was, except this is using purely Haskell functions. This is not using any uh, template Haskell, which is, by the way, if you've been around the Haskell database interaction debate long enough, there's uh, this library called Groundhog, which is saying persistent is cool, but we should not be using template Haskell because it's dangerous. We don't understand what it does. So let's instead basically try to do everything persistent does, but without ever leveraging template Haskell. So if you're afraid of template Haskell, you can check out Groundhog. It's Seems like a worthy competitor. I haven't used it much, but people say good things. And the way this works is that this tries to look a lot like a SQL query. As you can see, there's a select, there's a from, there's a list of tables. Uh, you can ignore these E dot. Uh, unfortunately, Escalator, or I suppose it just so happens that not by accident that Escalator shares a lot of the same functions as persistent. So it's very difficult to have them coexist in the same, uh, in the same namespace, in the same module without really qualifying uh, one or the other. And the documentations do a pretty good job at explaining you how to do that. So it, it generally, it looks a little bit prettier than this because you can strip out the E dot, but bear with me. What this query does is says, select, do a join between, inner join between these two tables. And uh, then you can specify the on condition for your join. This is, just a, uh, this is just a projection. It just says, from the table users, use the user ID column. This is all type checked. Once again, that's really neat. And then I can specify a work clause. And again, type checked. I'm using username. And uh, then it says, out of this result set that I've just generated in that join, I want to just select paragraphs. So that will do, behind the scenes, that will essentially run paragraphs.star for you. Or maybe it will use all the column names. I don't know. You can spit out the raw SQL for these things and, it actually, and actually investigate what it looks like. Or go to your logs. So let's try running that. Still works. Magic. So this query was done with Escalado. And you can write pretty much as long as your query is not insane and you're doing really large analytics queries, which you need a you know, data science person for. For application type queries, Escalator is great, and you can get away pretty, you can go pretty far with it. You can do sub queries. It's, it's great. You just have to get used to the syntax, which might be a lot to, to deal with at first, because, what's up? They, so I don't think Snowman really feels the need to do that because Escalator pretty much does the job that you would expect from uh, an, an EDSL for SQL in Haskell. They're, they're very complementary. There's, if you wanted to extend persistent, it would 
probably end up looking like this anyway. And they, they've actually, you know, they worked together, these two libraries have worked together for several years now. So this is kind of the accepted way of writing extended SQL to do, to do both. It is, it, Escalator is just basically a wrapper around persistent behind the scenes. The reason why you want to do both at the same time is because Escalator leverages the entities that are generated by that template Haskell and builds on top of them. So you wouldn't want, you couldn't use Escalator by itself because it needs that to be at the bottom. Now the other thing that's really cool about it is that we like composing things in Haskell and or really just in general in functional programming. And it just so happens that Escalator is pretty much the, the, the ideal way to do that because it allows you to define, to take any piece of your query and save it somewhere else and then you know thread it around if you want to, pass it around. So for example here I'm defining this where clause. I, uh, you could specify the types for it if you really wanted to. I think they are somewhat crazy, so I, I'm just letting um, I'm just letting GHC figure this out for me. Uh, Haskell is dynamically typed if you wanted to, apparently. And um, here I'm saying I want to have this where clause that looks at the user table and it checks it filters it by username equals Alex. And here I actually use this function. I compose it into my query, and now I am able to reuse it as much as I want. I could just use it in all of my queries. We do a lot of composition, actually, at front row with uh, Escalator. You don't want to go too crazy because then you start creating a lot of distance between the actual query that gets generated at the very end and this crazy composition that you've created over months and months of stitching together code. Uh, so you, you generally want to double check what that's spitting out in uh, SQL just so it's not too, too crazy. But you can get pretty far with it because it's all type checked so it will not let you, it's not just stitching strings behind the scenes. It's actually telling you that only a where clause can go here. This is an or block can go here but not in this section. So it will not randomly generate broken SQL for you. It's, it's very, very safe. There maybe have been a couple of instances where it generated some mumbo jumbo a while ago, but that, those are really, really rare. And once again, you can run that, and this is, it's using that where clause behind the scenes for you to, to make the query. So as you can see, this is the. That's correct. Yep. Yeah, it's. It tries to have as much of a one-to-one -one correspondence with the final query as possible, where it will just, it's not like an ORM where you're not really sure what you're going to go get in the end. This is very much one-to-one. -one. So there should be no surprises. Not that ORMs are bad. Uh, they're, it's, it's also a contentious point in the community, but it is, it is not one. All right, so I think this, this should be it. Let me go back here. Alrighty, so just to wrap things up for you guys real quick about what we talked about. If you're just trying if you're trying to move fast and you're trying to get stuff done against the database, then it's really hard to go wrong with persistent just because it's incre incredibly well documented. It is it's had years of work put into it. It's worked for, it's used in production by us and probably a couple of other companies, uh, as, as many company, Haskell companies as you can, as you can think of. And uh, I would say you don't want to necessarily fear template Haskell. It does have downsides in terms of you don't quite know what it's generating, but on the plus side, uh, unless you dig into it, but on the plus side, you have GHC to double check it for you, which at least gives you, gets you most of the way there. And uh, it does add a bit of compilation time delay. It does make things slower to compile, but it's probably worth it in terms of dry, in terms of not repeating yourself and not having to do a lot of boilerplate yourself. And you can get away pretty far with just using persistent, but once you get fancy, Escalado is the go-to library that you should be using. And you should never write raw queries because you will have a bad time just like we had multiple times. Now, 
If you want great references for this, I would recommend reading this post by uh, O. Charles. He does that um, blog series about 24 days of hackage, 24 days of uh, GHC extensions. So this one is pretty good. It's a good place to start. I would say, whoops. I would say, I would say you won't have to use template Haskell for a while if you're just starting out. We, I don't think we've had to even write it at all, maybe once or twice. So don't worry about it too much. The stuff just works. And uh, remember that there's a whole book for persistent. Like the guy actually went out of his way to make a book for it. So you are very well served in, term, in terms of documentation. There's also a Google Groups, which is pretty active. So feel free to use that as well. Quick product placement right here. We're hiring, as always. We love Haskell. That's, that might look like not a heart. And um, drop us a line at that website. A couple of you, of you guys have done it last time. We love that. We'd let, love to see more. You don't have to know Haskell already. We will pretty much teach it to you if you don't. If you don't. We just need solid people. And if you want to hear more rambling from me, I'm on Twitter. It really depends on our hiring phase. If I'm hiring a lot, I'm just I'm not on there too much. But otherwise, I like to blabber on there. And I will open myself up to questions.